So, uh, so he, he said most of these things about me, but uh, indeed, uh, I'm a researcher at the CWI in Amsterdam, and I have been for now more than half my life. Um, and indeed, I did co-design ABC, which was used as the basis for, uh, for Python. I wrote part of GCC. At the end of the 80s, I built a system that if you saw it now, and you'll see a, a, a screen dump of it shortly, you would call it a browser. And as a result of that, I ended up organizing workshops at the first web conference in 1994, met Tim Burns. Berners-Lee, and he said, why don't you come and do stuff with us at this new W3C I'm about to start? And as a consequence of that, I ended up chairing the HTML working group for the best part of a decade, and I'm a co-author then of a whole row of uh, uh, web uh, technologies as a result of that, including HTML4 and CSS and HTML. So here's... Uh, here's uh, uh, so. Uh, Hido recently asked me, Hido von Rossum from, of, of Python, he recently asked me, have you, because uh, he was being interviewed for a, a, a journal about the, the whole uh, history of Python, he said, have you got any photographs from that period? And I said, only embarrassing ones. <laughs> and this is just one of them. This was a party we were at. They tell me it was a very good party. I don't remember anything about it. Um, so ABC, I should say that when we were first designing ABC, and this was starting in 82, uh, we were considered crazy in lots of ways because we were designing it as an interpreted language. And you have to remember this, this laptop that I'm using here is about 25 million dry stones and the l computer that we had then was 400 dry stones. So 400 to 25 million is a big jump. So the computers then were very, very slow and as a result, ABC ran very, very slowly. But of course, we knew about Moore's Law and what we were trying to do was design a programming language that was more direct to the programmer than the computer is more trying to address the computer the programmer's needs uh, and the funny thing was that because we did that everything was much higher level than programming languages at that time and so even though it was interpreted very often the programs ran faster than the equivalent uh, compiled program anyway so you may have heard of the Negroponte switch. The Negroponte switch uh, is from Nicholas Negroponte in his book, Being Digital, and he says, everything that used to go over cables now goes over the air, and everything that used to go over the air now goes over cables. So what used to go over cables, telephone, telephones, uh, uh, calls, and they now go over the air via radio, and television used to go over the air via uh, radio, and then now goes through, uh, through cables. So that was the Negroponte switch. And what I want to talk about today is what I call more switch and it's based on this in the 50s computers were very very expensive and we're talking about millions in fact they were so expensive that almost nobody bought a computer they always leased them to rent time on a computer in those days cost you a thousand dollars of that order a thousand dollars per hour and in the 50s that was of the same order as the yearly cost of a programmer the, the, the income of a programmer uh, was, uh, was, was about $1,000. So in other words, computers were really, really expensive compared with programmers. And in fact, when you, when you leased a computer, you usually got a couple of programmers for free into the bargain. That, that They sort of came and looked after your computer and they could write programs for you. So programming was, was really essentially free because computers were so expensive. And nowadays, and this is my Moore switch, it's exactly the opposite, because computers are as good as free, right? Whereas a programmer is really expensive. A programmer is going to be costing you at least of the order of 100,000 a year using a computer that costs about 1,000, which, uh, which lasts about three years. So, so essentially, the computers are free, and the programmers are really, really expensive. However, in the 50s, because the computer's time was expensive, Programmers would work like this, and I have to say I'm old enough that I actually have been through this process just as a teenager. When you wrote a program, you wrote, well, first you wrote it out on, on, on paper and you got it all right, and then you copied it out line for line on special paper, which you then gave to a special data typist who would then type the program in for you, come out on punch cords, of course, and then those punch cards would give, be given to a third person who would type it all out again just to make sure that the person who typed it the first time typed it right. Now, why put all these people into this process? Because it was cheaper to have three people doing this than to have the computer discover the errors. So, computers were... Hello. Computers were really expensive, and, uh, and pr people were really cheap. 
And so that, the 50s was when the first programming languages were designed. And of course, that meant that the programming languages were designed to save as much computer time as possible, because it didn't matter if it took the programmer loads of time to write the program, because the programmer was free. What you had to save was the amount of time that the computer was spending on your, uh, on your program. And so they were designed in terms of the computer and not in terms of the programmer. Now, happy birthday, Moore's Law. Last year, Moore's Law was 50 years old. Uh, and I, I, it really, I felt it very sorry, I was very sad that nobody took the opportunity to say, well, it's actually 33 and a third iterations of itself old. Because Moore, well, this is, this is his original graph. In 1965, he said that, uh, that um, uh, we were going to get twice as much uh, on our integrated chips per year for the same price. And after 10 years in 75, he said, no, it's going to be every 18 months. And since then, it has been more or less 18 months. Um, and uh, so last year, when, uh, when Moore's Law had its birthday, there were a, a new spate of articles about it. And, and everybody, everybody was saying, well, but it's nearly over. And I have to tell you that I heard, first heard somebody tell me that, that Moore's Law was nearly over in 1977. Uh, at, I was working at Manchester University. The great Grace Hopper, who's the woman who wrote the first COBOL compiler, she, she, she used to carry around a piece of wire uh, of uh, 30 centimeters long, and she said, this is a nanosecond. Um, and, uh, and that was, for some reason or another, the reason why Moore's Law was about to end. But she was wrong, and I've heard it dozens of times since then, and they were all wrong. And so I've never believed anyone ever, ever since. Um, and in fact, one wag tweeted last year, the number of press articles speculating the end of Moore's Law doubles every 18 months. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and here's a data point. Last year, the Raspberry Pi 2 came out exactly three years after the Raspberry Pi 1. So that's exactly two iterations of Moore's Law. So the question is, is the Raspberry Pi 2 exactly four times the power of the Raspberry 1? Well, here we go. It's six times faster. It's got four times as many cores. It's got four times as much memory, twice as many USB ports. It's the same size, and it's the same price. Conclusion. Moore's Law is not dead yet. So anyway, of course, computers don't get twice as fast exactly, exactly twice as fast exactly every 18 months. But I, for some reason or another, I've been tracking the speed of my computers since 1988. I use 1988 as the, uh, as the epoch because that's when uh, uh, the internet came to, uh, to the Netherlands, to Europe. Um, and you can see that there's a, there's a pretty good doubling there. That's a logarithmic scale. And so over the years, computers have been, uh, or at least my computers at roughly the same price, have been uh, doubling in power pretty constantly. So in other words, in the 50s, computers, uh, since the comu 50s, computers have become incredibly cheap and incredibly powerful. And yet we're still proging them on Pro with programming languages that were designed to save the computer work. I mean, all the languages we use now are still based on the initial premises of those, uh, those original programming languages 50 years ago. You can, you can trace uh, the, 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 the hierarchy, as it were. But in fact, most computers spend most of their time idle. I mean, this computer, when I was uh, writing these slides, it was idle. You can see a bump at the end. That's when I made, uh, made the, uh, uh, the screen that shot. Uh, but otherwise, it wasn't doing very much at all. In other words, there's loads of computer power sitting here unused. What we need to do is take the load off the programmer and put it on the computer, use some of that spare power. So to go back now again, uh, in the 1970s, uh, computers had become about two orders of magnitude cheaper, but programmers hadn't. And so suddenly, the cost of programmers started to hurt. And in fact, it, caused, it coined this term, the software crisis, which was because all of a sudden, uh, the price of software was causing, was, was causing the problem. The American Department of Defense uh, did some research and discovered that 90% of the cost of programming is debugging. And interestingly, around the same time, Fred Brooks, who, uh, who was a, a big manager at IBM, uh, was doing some studying, uh, a study on how many bugs there were in programs. And what he discovered was bugs in programs are not linear with the size. So if you get a program that's twice as large, you don't get twice as many bugs. You get more than twice as many bugs. And he actually 
worked it out that it's a, it's a power function, it's the length to the power of 1.5. In other words, if a program is 10 times as long, it doesn't have 10 times as many bugs, it has 30 times as many bugs. Or if you, the other way around, of course, uh, uh, you, it, it's, it's got 3% of the bugs. It means that a program 10 times longer costs 30 times as much to make, and that's from, from the American DOD result. So if we look at, uh, at a graph of this, this is what I call the verbosity gra uh, gap. What you see here then is the blue line, which is as the programs get longer and longer, and the red line, the number of bugs, or alternatively, what it costs to produce a program of that length. So in other words, the larger the program, relatively very much more expensive. So what can we do? Since the 1950s, computers have become roughly 11 trillion times faster, uh, which is 11 million million, that's an American trillion. And in that time, I reckon that programmers have become maybe 10, and if you're very lucky, 100 times more productive. And uh, the difference, this difference is absolutely enormous. So what can be done? What does it mean to be an order of magnitude more productive? It means that a program uh, that you could write in a week, week, you can now just write in a morning, or a program that would take a month, you can now do in two days, or a program that would take a year, you could produce in a month. So clearly, uh, an order of magnitude improvement is something to be, uh, something to be striven for. Uh, so how, how might it be achievable? Well, uh, the word declarative got uh, mentioned in the last talk. Uh, uh, and I think that that's the clue. We learn in school that what numbers are, for instance, and how to add and subtract and multiply and divide. We actually learn how to do those processes. But the first time that we ever hear a declarative definition, I think, is when we get to square roots. And all we're told is a square root of a number is the number that when you multiply by itself, you get the original number back. So that's very short. It's, it tells you what something is so you can understand it. It tells you how you can recognize if it's a square root or not, but it doesn't tell you how to calculate it. And I don't think, I don't believe anybody n learns how to uh, calculate a square root when they, by the time they get out of school because we've got calculators. Oh, you, you did? Okay, all right. I certainly didn't, although I now do know how to do it. And, and, and if you look at the code that's, that, that, that calculates the square root, well, if, I ask, if I'd asked you at the beginning of, the, of the, this talk, what does this code do? I think that you would have had a struggle to work out that it was working at a square root. What does it do? Under what conditions? How does it do it? What's the theory behind it? I know the theory behind it, but it actually doesn't show up in this code. Is it correct? Can you prove it? Uh, under what conditions can you re replace different bits? So if you put them by the side by side, you can see clearly uh, the procedural version of doing square root is, is very much longer than declarative. And, and the advantages of declarative methods is that they're much shorter, they're much easier to understand, uh, because that's what it's about. In a way, they're independent of the, of the exact implementation. Uh, they're less likely to com contain errors because of the shortness, actually. It's easier to see that they're correct, uh, and they're tractable, which means you can actually do stuff with them. So, as you can guess, I'm, I'm saying, well, we need uh, declarative programming, but what does declarative programming mean? And I'm just going to give you a couple of examples, and I, I'm not going to say that this is solved yet, but it's just that I think that this is the future of how uh, programming will go. So, this is the code for a clock on your screen, an, an analog clock with hands ticking round. Uh, at the time uh, that I went searching for this, this was the shortest one I could find. It's a thousand lines of code. It was written by Sun, it's copyright, please do not copy this. Um, this was the shortest I found. I found one that was four times longer, 4,000 lines of code. Uh, and, and honestly, if you, if you looked in this, I think there's one or two lines that have anything to do with time. All the rest is events and resizing and uh, pfft, really uh, awful, horrible. Horrible to read, horrible to do anything with it. Now, what I'm going to show you is the actual code, and then I'm going to show you the screen dump of it running, just a screen dump of when it was running, uh, for a declarative clock. This is basically all of it. It says that a clock is just three things, which we know are integers, hour, minute, and second. And then the other bits are just a style sheet. And it says it's displayed as a circled combination of the hour hand, the minute hand, the second hand, and some decoration. And the second hand is a line of some length rotated by a certain amount, 
related to the seconds, and so on and so on and so on. So basically, this, this top bit is the, the definition of what a clock is, and underneath it, I declare one, and I just set the s set, and these are not assignments, these are, these are invariants, and I say that the second hand, the seconds, sorry, of the clock is the system seconds mod 60, and the minute is the system seconds div 60 mod 60, and so on. And so this is what it actually looked like. You can see this was 1993 this was running. This is the browser that I was telling you about. It was, it's not based on HTML, it's not based on HTTP, but it, it's, it's the, the same concept. And what you can see there is the, uh, the, the, the clock, the system time that's driving it. Uh, there's a, a different version of the clock there with a different style sheet. But basically, uh, with a dozen lines of code, I could, I could define this thing compared with the 1,000 lines of code for the Sun system. So, although the rest of this talk is going to sound like a, a sales pitch for Xforms, it's absolutely not. It's, Xforms is just another example of a language that uses uh, declarative, uh, declarative programming. Um, it's, uh, it's a W3C standard, so it is actually standardized. Um, it's actually used in very many places, although you don't know it because it's, it's back office stuff. Um, but what you do is you specify what you want and not how you want it to be achieved, and you leave a lot of the work over to the, uh, to the computer. So uh, let me get, just give you a very quick example. I'm not going to go through this, but here, oh, that's not that one, not that one I wanted. It's, uh, oh, I see, it's that one. So this is an Xforms. Uh, uh, application. It's a map application. You can drag stuff. Uh, you can d use different maps. Uh, so here's a cycle map. Uh, here's the transport map. Here's the impressionist map. Uh, uh, somebody, somebody, w somewhere generates uh, for the whole world impressionist uh, versions of maps. Um, and, and you know, and you can, do, you, of course, you can do the, the regular sort of stuff, zooming and, and, and so on. So n it's in a way, it's no big deal except that that's written in 150 lines of code, right from scratch. There's nothing special in there to do with maps, it's just starting from scratch in about 150 lines of code. And there's not a single while loop, and that's, a, that's an absolute essential part of declarative coding. There are no while loops at all because you're just spe specifying relationships for data. Now, I'm not gonna go through this code. These slides will be online by tomorrow, I'm not going to tell you where, because if you can't find them, you should resign from your current job. <laughs> uh, but this is the essence of how this program works. It, I mean, just like a clock is three numbers, a map is just actually three values, the x and y coordinate and the zoom. That's it. I mean, that's what it's really about. So then I say, well, the site is where I get the, 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 uh, the, the tiles from. Um, you have to work out the scale, because as you zoom in and out, the scale changes. Uh, then you work out which t X and Y tile you want, and then you work out the URL, which is just the site plus the zoom plus the tile X, tile Y, and dot ping. Uh, and, and all the other stuff is just detail. And so, so you know, here's, here's 10 lines. That's the absolute uh, essence of, of the mapping, uh, uh, mapping uh, app. And the rest is just making sure, for instance, that the X, Y point is exactly in the middle, uh, uh, and, and stuff like that. And, uh, but dragging is only a question of editing X and Y. Those X and Y values are live. And so as I drag it, all that happens is X and Y gets changed, and the whole system says, oh, X and Y's changed. I better change all the rest of it, too. No work from my side. So the slides are online. You can click through on the walkthrough if you really want to know all the details. So. The bottom line of Xforms is that uh, it's now been around for, quite, uh, for, for about 10 years, and we've seen consistently that it gives about a 10 times saving in costs compared with traditional programming methods. A co correspondent in Denmark who was converting a lot of program apps from JavaScript to, uh, uh, to Xforms reports that the Xforms were about a quarter of the size, which means because of the, 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 that gap uh, uh, graph that I drew, that we should expect about a, a, a production time and cost reduction of about a order of magnitude, one eighth. And that's indeed what we, happen, ha what we get. And let me give you the poster child example. A company that I'm not allowed to tell you about because they're making so much money on this that they don't want their competitors to know, make huge machines, huge walk-in machines. And so I'm going to, it's not shipbuilding, unless I'm double bluffing you, 
But uh, imagine a ship. You build a ship once off, right? And each ship is different. And the person who wants the ship says, I want two swimming pools, and I want three bars, and I want uh, uh, air conditioning, uh, but not in tourist class, and uh, whatever. They, uh, you know, there's a whole long checklist of things they want. And then there's a control room for the ship. And that control room is therefore different for every different ship. And so they set people to programming the user interface of the control room for the whole ship. And they, have no, they knew from experience that that took them five years with 30 people to do right, to get it finished. And then one year they said, we're going to try X-Forms as a pilot. And they did it in one year with 10 people. So that is a saving of more than an order of magnitude. If one person costs 100,000 a year, uh, then they've saved 14 million and four years. So, in other words, this is my poster child, of course, because uh, this is big money that they've saved by using declarative programming. But uh, there, is, there are other stories, and I, I think I've only got one more or maybe two, uh, which this is another one. This is, this is uh, I, I, again, I won't tell the company, but it's British Insurance. Um, the manager had heard about this declarative programming, and, uh, and so he said, and he knew there was sort of disagreement in the team about it, so he said to the JavaScript man and the XForms man, I want you to come back to me in two days with an estimate of how long you think this application that I want is going to be built, how long it will take to, to build it. So two days later, they came back, and the JavaScript man said, I'll need 30 days to work out how long it's going to take to program it. And the XForms man said, I've done it already. <laughs> So this is my last thing. This is just a, a, an, another guy uh, who's been, who works uh, who, who works in, uh, in in this case in uh, in real estate. For years he'd uh, he'd been using traditional methods, and then one year he tried XForms, and he said, "I was hooked." After spending over 20 years building applications with a variety of procedural languages, I found my preferred architecture. I've seen the power of XForms and exist, and I can't conceive of returning to my procedural programming ways. So now I'm not going to say that you should all now move to XForms because I don't think that XForms will necessarily cover your, your area. All I'm saying is that XForms has, has demonstrated, as far as I'm concerned, that procedural pro, uh, proce sorry, that uh, the declarative programming is both realistic and achievable, and that it, it gives an enormous savings, an order of magnitude savings in time and cost and that, therefore, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's worth doing. So my, my conclusion is this. For historical reasons, present programming languages are at the wrong level of abstraction. They're talking to the computer rather than talking about the problem. And that <laughs> I'm pretty convinced that once program managers hear about declarative programming and that they can save 90% of their costs, they will be ordering switches to declarative programming. I believe that eventually, and may take 10, 20, 30 years, I may not even live to see it, but that everyone will be programming declaratively because you've got less errors, you've got more time for yourself, uh, or you can produce better programs. Thank you. <laughs> has, has anybody actually used the couch today? Oh, well, I, I really think that if people are going to ask me questions, then I could... Um, no, actually, you can't see me then. Yes, exactly. I think there's, uh, <laughs> there's uh, enough time for questions, so uh, let's get the discussion started, I would say. Uh, she will raise some qu discussions, I think. That's the point you made. There you go. Um, don't we see the opposite of what you're um, saying today, and that is that some uh, over lots of companies are moving back from Python, the high-level language, uh, down to Rust or Go and to more performant languages. So they don't think that the computers are free, and they're actually um, moving bit, bits around and uh, messing with memory uh, whatever stuff. So what's your comment on that? I think, firstly, They've either not done the sums, or they don't know that the sums exist. And secondly, and I, and I have to say that there's a big pushback against this sort of thing, because, and, uh, because a lot of programmers don't like the idea or that their skills are, the skills that they've now got are no longer valuable, because declarative programming is a new way of thinking and a new way of programming. And so, uh, th so it, you know, it really wouldn't surprise me if there's a pushback within the programming teams that the programming manager, who has no clue, 
goes down to the, the, to the programmers and says, you know, well, I've heard about this declarative programming, should we do it? And they all go, no, rubbish. Not, not, not performant, uh, we, we shouldn't be doing it. Uh, but, um, and, and funnily enough, I've just been reading a book about the introduction of the sort of numbers that we use now with, with zeros and one, two, three, four, five, nine, nine, and so on, compared with Roman numbers. And that there was an enormous fight against using the sort of numbers we use now. Uh, and you think, why on earth? Uh, you know, countries banned uh, uh, Ar uh, Roman Arabic numeral numerals as we now use, uh, sorry, Arabic numerals as we now n use them, uh, because the old way was the best way or something. So I, I anticipate that there will be pushback. And uh, that's why I don't think it will happen tomorrow. Um, but the reason that I think it will happen eventually is because that once you discover it, uh, you don't want to let it go. One second. Yes. Um, declarative uh, programming. If you have the example of the square root, you uh, what what is the algorithm that is used? That that is uh, because yeah. Well, I, and I think this is a, a very good question that I would expect from programmers, because that's not what it's about. Because it's it's about defining relationships and not defining the algorithm. And I'm not asking for magic here. I'm not saying that somehow the computer's got to work out, oh, well, square roots means this. Uh, so sometimes you have, to, you have to specify a bit more. But uh, in general, in, in declarative languages, it, it just falls out of the, of the relationships between things. So you're right. Eventually, somebody's got to write a square root uh, 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 algorithm. But then it stops. Okay. In fact, in fact, you don't. Uh, uh, so I said in in that in that showing that procedural function for square root, that there was some theory behind it. In fact, what you would do is write the theory, uh, and and from the theory you can pretty easily derive the the algorithm without having to have a human involved in it. So you can still do it declaratively one level up, uh, talking about functions and derivatives. Okay. Oh, I'm being filmed. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Hey, um, what's your take on uh, functional reactive programming and languages like Elm, frameworks like ReactJS? Do you think of them as a stepping stone towards declarative programming? Yeah, or I, do you think of them as the end all be all? No, well, I, th I think of them as, as indeed of, ste of stepping stones in, in the right direction. Uh, de definitely. I mean, um, You've got to you've got uh, got to implement these things in something anyway, uh, so you can sort of make a programming framework out of a, pr a programming language, and it may may work. But the problem is this. Let me let me see if I can uh, find a good an analogy. Yes, I can find an analogy. So ABC, the programming language, as I said, it sometimes ran faster than a compiled version in another language. And why was that? That's because in ABC, one of the fundamental elements of it is sorting and searching. We did an analysis of what people do when they program, and we found that it's almost always about sorting and sorting and searching, and then some other stuff around it. So that sorting and searching ought to be the or one of the, the central elements. And so that meant that the, 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 the sorting and searching algorithm in, in the ABC system was fine-tuned up the wazoo. I mean, it, you know, if we could get, get another millisecond of it, we, we did. So that meant that when you were doing sorting and searching, although it was interpreted, the, all the sorting and searching was being done natively by a really good algorithm. And people would say, yeah, but we could do that in Pascal as well. And the thing was, they didn't. Nobody, or nearly nobody, bothered going to that level of detail of programming a sorting algorithm in Pascal, because they just did something that was easy and quick and good enough. And so the point is, my point is here that you could do it uh, at another level, but then 
you can be tempted away to go and do something else just because it was available, and oh yeah, I know how to do it that way. And, uh, uh, and, and so I think that a system that is absolutely designed to be declarative will in the end be more valuable. Uh, I don't see, or I haven't heard of the big uh, companies like Google, Microsoft uh, coming with, up with this sort of paradigm yet. Uh, or do you see something emerging there, uh, or what, what do you anticipate they will do? I know big companies using this stuff. Um, there's the one that I can't tell you about. <laughs> but Xerox, Yahoo, BBC, uh, a number of banks, um, uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratories in the United States. Um, I, I don't have the list completely ready, but I have a huge list of, of, of people who do use this stuff already. It's in small groups. It hasn't spread out so that it's become a, a, an organizational decision, except for that one company I can't tell you about, um, uh, to, to use it. But, uh, uh, but uh, it's, it's bit quite widely used, actually. Um, if everything is going to move toward declarative, what do you think is going to happen with Python? What happened to Pascal? <laughs> Actually, now that you ask it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> this is a good answer. Uh, thank you for the talk. And what is the best way to start doing declarative programming nowadays? Where should I start if I am interested in it? Well, I mean, have a look at, at my, my uh, Xforms map example and then and follow the links to tutorials about uh, Xforms. I mean, that's, that's the only standardized version that I know of uh, that, uh, that, that does this stuff. Um, uh, there are some frameworks that, that do sim similar sort of stuff, but uh, I don't, there are not many that, that, that ab absolutely focus on this way of doing it. So I'd say go and have a look at Xforms first. What are your thoughts on when we're going to see self-hosting declarative language compilers? Self self-hosting. Self-hosting declarative compilers. Well, funnily enough, that so that that one you saw uh, the screen dump of, I was in the middle of doing that when the project got uh, um, got got uh, cancelled. Um, so it's not impossible. Uh, I, I have half of one ready, <laughs> or at least half half of one re re written. Um, uh, so uh, it, it's it's not a big deal, really. There are there are some some edge cases that are difficult, but 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 basically it was you know it was more of the same. <laughs> yeah. Any more questions? I have a question: that Does does it get the proper attention? A declarative program does it get the proper attention in education and computer science education? You think? Uh, I think most people is new here. Well, uh, the, strictly speaking, spreadsheets are declarative. Yes. And if there's one thing they do teach at school when they te teach uh, teach uh, what they call computing, uh, they teach uh, spreadsheets. So there's so there's a, a little little sprinkling of this, but no, absolutely not. No, I mean, it's 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 quite begin day beginning days of uh, of, of of the concept in a way. Uh, and uh, it still has to develop. We need books about it and stuff like that first. Any good, book, any good books that you can recommend? To start there are off? no books on it, no. No books? No. no. Your site then. Excellent. Big chance. <laughs> okay. Final round, anyone? Question? Last one? Okay. Uh, yeah, you said there are no books, so do you consider Prolog a declarative language? Because I'm pretty sure the books in that. Do I consider prologue declarative? Not, not in the same way, really. I mean, I, I can see what you mean, and it comes from a sort of similar sort of thought process. Um, but, um, but I don't consider it declarative, no. Another question here? Yeah. Uh, would you say you have uh, a lot of, if you come from a design background, you have a lot of uh, 
well, you can you can easily program in a uh, declarative programming language uh, instead of exactly being from a programming background? I, I, I suspect, although I definitely have not put this to the test yet because it's too, so early days, but I suspect that programming in declarative languages will be very much easier. And the reason that I think that is because you get people who can't program who can produce reasonably useful spreadsheets. And, yeah. <laughs> no, Can I ask I, another one? Uh, don't, don't laugh, I'm serious. They, I mean, you, people who can't program can, can produce spreadsheets that actually do something useful for themselves without having to learn how to program. And there are no while loops in, spre in spreadsheets. Uh, and and, and that, the, the hard part of programming is a while loop. Believe me. I have another question. That's where most of the bugs are as well. Can I ask another one? Okay. Uh, would you say, uh, is there a chance that artificial intelligence <laughs> would have a, a chance of well, programming in a language that's somewhat easier to program in because it's declarative? Well, actually, this is the, is the, one, the one thing that I, that I didn't say that I had considered, th well, or thought about saying was that the question is, will, will we start using declarative languages before computers get smart enough to program themselves? At which point, who cares? Which you say, you say to the computer, do that, and it does it. And so, who needs programmers, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> I would say, and on that bombshell, please <laughs> give a warm hand from Mr. Stephen <laughs> Pemberton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. I have some final remarks to make, so please uh, remain seated. Somebody took the um, mini display port adapter somewhere. Does anybody want the speakers? Or? Yeah. Now that's some VGA. I mean, it's from HDMI to. Do you have one? Okay, cool. I'll do that. Okay. Let's see. Are we on screen? Oh, yeah. We'll switch in a second one. Because I got a the, uh, the benevolent dictator of life sent us a message. I would like to share it with you guys. But it should be on screen in a minute. Oh, that's me. <laughs> Almost. One second. Three, two, one. Uh, so I can get the display. Uh, sees nothing. And we'll see if we can detect it. No, nothing yet? <laughs> ah, there we are, yeah. Anyways, Python, uh, Guido mailed me uh, about yesterday. He said, uh, well, welcome. You like to this, uh, you like me to share this with you guys. He said, welcome. Python is my favorite, I'll translate it in English, my favorite Dutch uh, Python uh, meeting, uh, also due to uh, 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 creative uh, uh, design. I hope everybody's busy with uh, which is <laughs> Thank you, Anna Lamp and Kabbalah uh, Kabam, thank you. Anna, thank you, where is she? Love that. He says, I hope everybody's busy with the conversion to Python 3 uh, already, of course, and uh, it's the best Python release ever. And for the rest, he hopes that everybody takes a look at MyPy, the optional statistical type checker for Python, which he's working on uh, uh, Guido at the moment, uh, which is Python 2.7 support. And of course, uh, the long time coming, maybe async IO, the standard for asynchronous IO in the Python, which has been in the standard library since 3.4 and 3.3 backported. Um, and 3.5 is even better with uh, async uh, dev and await. Greetings for all of your benevolent dictator for life, Guido for awesome. So uh, thanks, for Guido, for, uh, for, for this one. I'm asking him every year from, could you please come over to the Netherlands? You were basically born here, but every year, he said, I'm, I'm here in San Francisco, and it's nice and warm, so maybe yeah. next year. So. <laughs> I, I just keep asking him, okay? <laughs> That's about uh, it. Um, for the rest, um, 
the presentations, yes? Okay, let's say, um, does anybody have a good video camera and say, Guido, come over. Yeah, that's a good idea. Somebody can take a, a, a small video clip on his camera. Yeah, but I'd like to see the audience asking it. Could you show the audience? No, somebody can, can film it from here. Yeah, exactly. Okay, uh, well, let's say, uh, 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 Guido, uh, we miss you. Come over next year, okay? Guido, we miss you. Come over next year. One, two. Guido, we miss you. Come over next year. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Very well.